Hey, what is up? We are back with another video. So this one, I'm going to be looking at my uh, NBA regular season award winners. So season ended a couple days ago. Playoffs are about to start. So when those come, more content's dropping, you know, daily recaps, daily reactions, you name it. Uh, because it's going to be a lot, uh, a lot of hype. It's going to be exciting. If there's uh, some background noise going on, I'm, I'm like filming in the basement. Super raining outside. It's like a hurricane or something. But okay, so let's get into it. Uh, so basically, we're going down the list. MVP, rookie of the year, sixth man of the year, coach of the year. Going to the all-NBA teams, going to the rookie teams. And I added like two awards at the end. I just made up on my own because I wanted to talk about some teams that uh, hadn't got any light in this video. So yeah, let's get it. Okay, so we're going to start off with MVP. Uh, so I, I have a top five for this, but only was able to fit three people's uh, numbers and stats on the screen. So number stats picture. Uh, I got I got Nikola Jokic winning it. And I don't I don't think this is too complicated. You know, he's clearly had the best season. His team finished third at the conference, so most people seem to have uh, kind of that that you know unread rule that you you would you want your MVP to be top three in the conference, right? So uh, he's got that uh, numbers, you know, 26, 11, and eight, crazy numbers. Uh, obviously, every MVP has had you know astronomical numbers, so. It might not stand out, but it's just clear he's had the best season, played every game, all 72. Uh, and really, what I'll say is, and this isn't to take credit away from Jokic, because I'm a fan of him. He 100% deserves the award. A lot of people have been pushing for some other guys recently, and we'll get to that soon. Uh, he He's mostly winning, though, because the top other candidates fell off at some place. So you want to look – at the all-star break, right? Draw a bead who's probably the leader that he gets hurt. And then the guy who was competing most with a bead was probably LeBron. He gets hurt. Uh, James Harden, he never really had a chance at winning because of what happened early in the season with Houston, but he also gets hurt. So uh, Jokic was kind of the winner by default. Nevertheless, he's 100% a deserving winner. Uh, props to him. He's going to be, this is going to be his first MVP. We'll see what he can do in the playoffs without Jamal Murray. Uh, so second, I got Embiid. And um, this is interesting. You know, I think some people might still be campaigning for him to win. But that injury really did hurt him throughout the years. He just hasn't been able to stay healthy. But this season, in my opinion, he elevated from being a, a high-tier all-star to a superstar. Uh, he showed that. I mean, you look at – okay, Uh like, last season, I think he probably put up, like, 23 points a game. Like, he was obviously good, but he wasn't flat-out dominant. In this season, he came out and flat-out dominated. Big games, primetime games. He goes, uh, goes out there and gives you 35, you know. Uh, farms the free throw line, right? Defensively, he brought it. You know, he could be in that toxic uh, – I think before the season, he said, I want to win an MVP. I want to win Defensive Player of the Year. He could have been in that conversation had he played a full season. Probably not for defensive player of the year, considering uh, his teammate and Rudy Gobert. But he was having that type of season. So for him to be second, despite missing 20 games, shows how good he was. I'm going to have to dock him a little bit, though, because when he was out, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me. I researched a lot to put on this list, but I, I didn't spend you know three hours checking everything out. Uh, from what, everything I can remember, they were they were pretty good without him. Tobias Harris, Ben Simmons, Danny Green, Dwight Howard, they held it down without him. It was a relatively easy schedule, but I think they lost maybe like two or three games. I remember they blew out one team. Uh, it, it's, it's just – I feel like he was very good in terms of the most valuable player, uh, most valuable award. Definitely, I'm going to give Jokic the edge, especially considering the more games played. But if they both played like 70, you know, or they both played 60 or something, it's still a very, like, it's still very, very close, I think. Jokic would have a great argument then. So, I'm 
Consider Jokic play 20 more games. Gonna give it to him. And the third, I have Giannis. Uh, Giannis, great season. Most people are in agreement. He was actually better than last season where he won the award. Uh, but voter fatigue combined with these two guys in front of him having excellent seasons, uh, he's going to be finished at third. So fourth and fifth, don't have them on the screen, but I have fourth, I have Chris Paul. So a lot of people have been putting Chris Paul number one. And I get it. In terms of what most valuable player is, he arguably could be. Uh, he Look at what he did with the Suns. The Suns did go 8-0 in the bubble last year. But he turns them from an AC competing for the AC. And this is my, my opinion. A lot of people are going to disagree. Suns without Chris Paul this year don't make the playoffs. I think they compete for that play-in. They compete for the 9-10 and 10 with the Grizzlies and Spurs. I don't think they, they end up making it into the playoffs. Or actually, it would be – then it would be the, the Spurs and Pelicans. I think they're on that team – uh, tier like the Spurs and Pelicans. They got Monty Williams, who's a really good coach. We'll talk about him later. But they're not, they're not this team without Chris Paul. Chris Paul's extremely valuable. But it's it's not just the MVP award. You you have to put up the numbers along with it. And I can't justify giving a guy who's averaging 16 points a game. Uh, and like Jokic. Jokic is beating him in basically every category. Jokic is shooting 57% from the field. Uh, 39 from three. Chris Paul, so once again, great defender, great value, really good passer, really good leader, second seed in the West. But I can't I can't justify putting him up there when he doesn't have those numbers to back it up. And Jokic is maybe just as valuable. No Jokic and the Nuggets probably don't make the playoffs. Uh, no Embiid, I think the Sixers make the playoffs, but they dropped the seven. No Giannis, the Bucks might drop the six. They still got a good team, so... That one I'm less sure about, but all of these guys are valuable. Okay, and the last guy I'm going to talk about. So this is going to make a lot of people mad, right? Where's Steph Curry? Steph Curry's fifth for me. Uh, and before I really sat down, thought about it, was like, okay, this is going on YouTube. I was like, Steph Curry would get my second place vote if I was a vote. So this is if I was a voter, right? Which I will be someday. Uh, the more I thought about it, though, I the way I'm seeing this is if Jokic doesn't exist, I'm giving the award to Embiid. If Embiid doesn't exist, I'm giving the award to Giannis. I can't justify putting Steph Curry second because he it's just because he's the AC. It really is. He's had a phenomenal season. Probably been the best NBA player this season. Maybe debatable with Jokic, Embiid, still LeBron there, guys like that. But he's been phenomenal. I I just can't sit here and say if if we make him the MVP, and this is something like Westbrook, my guy, right? Phenomenal. Great, great, great season two years ago. Six seed and one MVP. And now we're starting to consider everybody in that area because he won it. So the more times voters give, you know, big props, put these guys top three who unfortunately ended up at the A7-6 seed, it's, it's just going to lead to, in my opinion, the, the literal definition, most valuable player being further and further diminished. So Steph Curry will be fifth for me. That's no disrespect to him. He's had a great season. Uh, but these are, all these guys have had great seasons. So we're going to move on to rookie of the year. Um, oh, shoot. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Give me a second. Sorry. Yeah, so rookie of the year. So – Three finalists right here, Anthony Edwards, LaMelo Ball, Tyrese Halliburton. So we'll start with Halliburton, who unfortunately is obviously third. In a year like 2016, where you had a Brogdon, Saric, Embiid, and there was no standout, Halliburton would have a good argument. And really, I think he just knows how to play basketball, you know, obviously. But he's a guy who... We'll look at his numbers, 47, 41, 90 splits. Uh, his shooting form is, is a little bit awkward, but it just goes in, right? Uh, he is, in my opinion, the most effective team player here. I'm not going to say he's the greatest impact because he's not a number one option in Sacramento. He's not a number two option. He's probably not even number three option because you have Fox Heald, Barnes. Nevertheless, though, he he's just a big contributor to winning there. Um 
And on draft night last year, I think he went 11 to the Kings, I want to say. Uh, I had not scouted that class, but everyone was already calling him a steal. And I'm like, okay, we'll have to see about that. But he sure as heck looks like a steal right now. And I'm, I need to give him props for what he did this year. Uh, despite not playing the most minutes, despite not having the biggest role, he was just an active contributor to winning on both ends. Um, and he's a guy who throughout his career, he's a guy that like every team is going to want him. You know, um, you look at some other players uh, who are who are like, you know, you could envision Ant and LaMelo. If they never develop into an effective number one option who can be a number one option on a championship contending team, a lot of people would rather have a guy like Halliburton. So, he, yeah, he's third on the list for me, clear third. But the top two are distance from him. Um, just more talented players. And these two guys, similar to Luca and Trey, but although I'm going to say this, Luca and Trey, I think there's a pretty big gap there. You know, Luca is a top 10 player. Trey probably closer to top 25. So these two guys, though, they'll be compared forever. So you know me, I'm a, I'm a Timberwolves fan. But really, bias aside, I think Ann is actually the clear winner. Uh, and, and it surprised me. So I've listened to a lot of podcasts. I looked at a lot of lists. Um, almost every big NBA writer, podcast speaker, uh, et cetera, they got LaMelo. And I understand it. But at the same time, I don't think people realize how good Edwards was the second half of the year um, since All-Star break. So the, the biggest argument I've heard is that LaMelo changed the culture in Charlotte. He made them fun to watch. And uh, like basically he has a greater impact on winning. But I'm going to be real. What we saw at the end of the season kind of countered that. Uh, because Charlotte ended up finishing 33-39. and 39. They're the 10th seed in the East. And I agree LaMelo made them better. But we can't be giving them major props for that. And then... You saw the statistics were like when he's playing and when he's not playing, they're around the same win percentage. Um, I think that dumb dropping afterwards was also a large impact of Gordon Hayward. People can't forget that. Gordon Hayward was probably their best player uh, this season, and he was injured while Lamella was injured. Still, they kept that uh, kind of similar record afloat due to, you know, Borrego. P.J. Washington, Terry Rozier, Devontae Graham. Good team there. Malik Monk, Miles Bridges. I can go on. So the the whole winning argument, I I can't go with that. I can't go. Efficiency. So Edwards did struggle to begin the year. I'm I'm not going to sit here and deny that. I was always a believer in him. I never called him a bust or anything. But you had fans yapping. You know, you had guys saying, oh, man, Timberwolves blew their draft pick again, right? Stuff like that. And – I, there was some concern, but the way he – like you look at his finishing stats and then you think about how bad he was at the beginning of the year. So think about how good he must have been in the second half or since the beginning to make the stats look like that. You know, 19 points a game, five rebounds, three assists. So not I mean, overwhelming, but very good. And then for how efficient he was, he ends up on 42, 33, 78. So a little bit below league average. I think league average for guards is like 44, 35. Something like that. So a little bit below for a rookie. And then you compare it to LaMelo. LaMelo's 44-35. So their efficiency ends up being pretty close. Edwards plays all 72 games. I'm not going to sit here and ignore that either. 21 games. I think these guys had pretty comparable rookie seasons. I might give a slight edge to LaMelo's play just because because he was he was more consistent throughout. He came in and it was an immediate contributor. He did make Charlotte basketball very exciting to watch. Edwards did the same for Minnesota. But, you know, with Minnesota finishing sixth worth record in the league, it's hard to argue that, right? But still, man, man, man. It, it's tough. It is tough. I understand why people go LaMelo, but – LaMelo's slight edge in play when they were uh, throughout the season, I think that's countered by this 21-game difference. This 21-game difference is big. I think Edwards, the way he finished down the stretch of the season, those 30 games or whatever it was, that was better than at any time LaMelo played this year. I think Ant averaged 24, 6, 4 on 
pretty solid efficiency, right? And the Timberwolves were winning. The Timberwolves were winning. I think with Chris Finch, they finished down a stretch maybe 0.500, a little bit above that. And had that and had more rookie of the year moments, in my opinion, too. He has his 40-point game against Phoenix, right? Games like that where they knock down a hot Phoenix team that is second in the whole league because of Edwards. He, yeah, he's the reason, as a Timberwolves fan, I have hope. Now, obviously, Charlotte fans can say the same thing. Uh, Lamel's the reason they have hope. So you can go both ways, but to me, and actually is a clear winner. Just phenomenal finish of the season. Uh, didn't miss time like LaMelo. And then the, I, I think the whole winning argument's a little bit ridiculous. And winning has never been a huge factor for rookies. And we're going to give credit to LaMelo for finishing 10th? I, I, I just don't know. But, hey, these guys are both great players. Excited to see their futures. Let's go on to most improved players. So this one's a little bit more clear cut. Julius Randle finishes first. Great season. You look at the numbers. He did, probably did not have the greatest improvement, right? That will be Jeremy Grant. Jeremy Grant had the greatest improvement statistical wise because I think he went from a 12 to 13 point per game score to 22. But numbers without context mean nothing. So let's talk about it. Julius Randle last year, 19 points a game. Knicks at the bottom of their conference. Knicks fans hate him. They're like, that's the classic empty stats player, right? In this season, they totally he totally turns it around. He becomes a 40% three-point shooter. Impressive. Becomes a six-assist guy. Facilitator. One of the best passing uh, power forwards in the league. Probably only second to Draymond Green. And Draymond Green's like a five-point-per-game scorer. So Randall is able to score. He's able to dish. Rebound defensively. Liability last year. I'm not going to call him an elite defender or anything, but he's improved significantly in that aspect. Uh, and then, yeah, most of all, you got to just factor in the culture change, what he's done for New York, bringing a lot of excitement to that team. He's going he's, he's gonna to win the award unanimously. First place, it could happen. It really could happen. I think what's happened with the Most Improved Player Award is always, every season, first 40, 30, 40 games, everybody's like – Oh wow, this this could go to five to six different guys. In the second half of the season, there's a runaway, right? And you can say that for a lot of awards, but specifically for most improved player, uh, it happened with Pascal Siakam that season. There was a lot of guys fighting for it. Who won? Who won it last season? I'm trying to remember. I can't. I can't even remember off the top of my head. I'm sure it pop, will pop up to me later on uh, who who won it. Okay, no, no, I have to Google it. It's bothering me. Brandon Ingram. Yep, Brandon Ingram. So last year even there was some of the, that discussion because Bam, it, it kind of came down to the wire. Bam was um, had a very good finish as well. But most people became uh, you know pretty pretty confident Ingram would end up winning it. Yeah, so that's enough talk about like the history of the award and uh, Rando. We'll go on to Jeremy Grant. So Grant is a guy that he, – he impressed me. I think a lot of people – will attribute his uh, growth to just having a bigger role. Like, okay, in Denver and OKC, he was the backseat to Westbrook and Oladipo in OKC. And then, or I don't know if he played with Oladipo, but obviously the backseat to Westbrook, who had one of the highest usage rates ever. In Denver, he's playing with Jamal Murray, Will Barton, Paul Millsap, uh, Nikola Jokic. He's in a bench role. So this summer... He gets offered a three-year, $60 million deal from both the Nuggets and Pistons. And he said, I'm going to bet on myself, right? He takes the Pistons deal because he wants a bigger role. And the season, he showed me that he he can be, you know, a second to third option on a good team, right? And uh, with the Pistons as a first option, 22 points a game. Uh, I remember watching him versus the Lakers earlier this season. I think it was a double OT game, maybe single OT. But he's going back and forth trading buckets with LeBron. He became a very well-rounded player. And I'd still like to see him take a jump in facilitating, you know, maybe creating his own shot uh, outside of the paint. But he, what he did this season really impressed me. Um, and I don't think it was because of, you know, empty stats. I don't think it was because of – just because of a bigger role. Obviously, it had some impact. I think what he did this season was uh, very, very impressive. I think he worked on this game a lot. Or maybe he always had it in him. But he deserves second for MIP. And at third, I got Porter Jr. Uh, you watched the last video, you know I think very highly of him. But without Jamal Murray, 
he really rates his game. I think without Jamal Murray, he's probably averaging 25 points a game. Even with Jamal Murray, still very good. So, uh, as you can see by his numbers, 19 points a game on insane efficiency. 45% from three, 54 from the field. Uh, and we'll see how he does in these playoffs, but I got him as third for most improved player. Christian Woods, a lot of uh, a lot of people are going to have him here, and I like Christian Wood. But P- real NBA fans realize that he was capable of doing this for a long time. It, it, with the Pelicans, at the end of the season, he was having these insane games. I remember because I picked him up in fantasy uh, on Detroit near the end of the season before he got COVID because he was the third guy to get COVID. He was he was uh, giving people the work, so I don't think he actually improved a ton this off season. I just think he was able to play a full season and people saw it. Uh, and then also he he didn't what's it called? He didn't play a lot of games. So these three guys, I got him over him. Jalen Brown also deserves a shout out. Chris Boucher, that's even say Norm Powell. A lot of guys deserve this uh, recognition, but these are the three I chose. Next up, we got sixth man of the year. So this is tough too. And really, it, for me, it came down to these two teammates, uh, Jordan Clarkson and Joe Ingles. Whew. I, I ended up going with Jordan Clarkson. He His first half of the season, and it's not, it's not to say he was bad in the second half, but he had some cold, cold games. But his first half of the season, he was too good. Ends up scoring 18. Uh, and really, really, he passed like the eye test. When you watch the Jazz, He's the guy who he comes in and he takes, he takes, you know, a corner contested three. And you're like, what is he doing? And he makes it. And then he catches fire. And that kind of warms up the whole team. At the same time, Joe Ingles, he does similar stuff. He just does it, does it differently. He shoots 45% from three. He's a really good facilitator. Uh, finds the open man. Always makes the right play. Good defender. Advanced stats love him. So it was close between these two. And I think I think part of it was you, you look at sixth man – the history of the award, it is often given to the, the bench microwave guys, right? Jamal Crawford, Lou Will, straight buckets. So I think Jordan Clarkson fits that mold a little bit more. Uh, and a lot of people were like, he's going to he's gonna become that perennial guy where he is, uh, you know, a Lou Will, a Jay crossover, right? And he's going to be able to be in contention for sixth man every year. So it was close between these two. I gave the edge to Clarkson. I just think he's a he's a little bit more of a traditional sixth man. Gives you buckets off the bench. And at third, I got Jalen Brunson. Shout out Jalen Brunson. Uh, he's he's been very good this season. Um, you know, 12, 4, and 4, 50, 40, almost a 90. Uh, he's hit some clutch shots for the Mavericks. I think, I think this season, because of how often Porzingis was out, you could argue he was their second best player. And I think that shows Luka needs some, some more help. No disrespect to Brunson. But it also shows how good he was. And in the playoffs this year, I'm really excited to see, okay, the Mavs can compete with the Clippers. I'm not saying they're going to win, but they can take it six, seven games if guys like Clarkson, guys like Josh Richardson, if guys like Tim Hardaway Jr., they keep up that regular season hot streak. Dorian Finney-Smith, Maxi Kleba. We'll see what uh, we'll see what happens with that. But Jalen Brunson, great year. And then a lot of people have Derrick Rose up there, and I, I like Derrick Rose. He he was part of that Knicks culture change, and he was their closer. He gave a lot of them a lot of big buckets, but he only played 50 games, and, and I think a, a lot of those were with the Pistons. So these guys right here, I feel like they performed at a similar, you can maybe say slightly worse, but I, I, if you haven't noticed already, I do value games played. So these guys all played 18-ish more games. And in my opinion, they were all at least close enough or better for me to put them on this list over rows. Okay, next up we got defensive player of the year. So yeah, I don't have any stats on here because I could have put steals and blocks. But that that, you know, we shouldn't just look at steals and blocks to uh, value defensive impact. A lot of it is you just have to watch the game. So I went with Rudy Gobert to get his third, I think it's his third uh time winning the award. Just the way he impacts the game. Rim protection is always going to be the biggest part of defense. And he does that better than anyone in the NBA. NBA. So I, I have to give it to him. Jazz have had a great defensive season. They're also the one seed in the West. One, uh, best team in the whole league in the regular season. Not saying that should impact the award, but it makes it 
easier for me to, you know, say, okay, he should win it, right? I I got Ben Simmons at two. Uh, Simmons could win this award a lot of other years. We've we've never really seen a guy 6'10", who can move like he does laterally, uh, can come up and press Damian Lillard at the half court, full court even. Uh, that was really his MVP moment in my opinion, that game against the Blazers where down to stretch, he absolutely terrorized Damian Lillard. So with him doing that, uh, really impressive perimeter defense. And I've heard a lot of people say he's like he's like Drew Holiday, but he's just five inches taller, which makes it you know a lot easier. So I got Simmons at second. I just have to value the rim protection. Simmons, great perimeter defender. Uh, Gobert is a great rim protector. Just think rim protection has a little bit more of a difference in today's game. And Adebayo gives you that mix. He can't quite defend as well one through five point guard through center as Simmons does, but he can do it dang well. And then he gives you that rim protection too. If you don't know, watch Heat Celtics game one overtime and see that block at the end. Uh, in my opinion, top three defensive play of all time in the finals. So yeah, I got Adebayo at, uh, at third. Coach of the year. Okay, we'll kind of go through this quick. Thibodeau, winner, what he did with the next season. I think with, when you do coach of the year, all these awards, actually, every single award, you have to value uh, expectation versus reality. The expectation for the Knicks was they're a bottom three team in the East. And if you want to say, oh, I didn't think they were bottom three, you probably had a bottom five. So they, they was a bottom five team in the East. They finished top four. Props to Thibs for that. Props to Julius Randle. Props to that whole team. But he is the leader of the ship. Quinn Snyder, I think, deserves a lot more credit than he's getting. He... Had that, and, and this is the difference between Quinn and Monty, in my opinion, both who did an excellent job this year. Quinn took a team that was the exact same as last year. This is the exact same team, Jazz team as last year. Obviously, it's one more year playing together, but no talent change. And he brings them from a six seed to a one seed. Monty Williams, now he brings them to from like, what were they, nine to two, right? So, you know, I got to give him props for that, but they, they did have, you know, uh, greater talent increase. You get Chris Paul, right? You get Jay Crowder, you know. Mikel Bridges really develops. So Jazz don't have a ton of young players. Donovan Mitchell's still young, right? But, the, you know, he he's kind of, I don't want to say at his ceiling because he can he can continue to grow. He can become maybe Dwayne Wade. But they don't they don't got young players developing like the Suns do with, with Cam Johnson, with Mikel Bridges, with Devin Booker. So... I gave a slight edge to Snyder over Williams because of that. These two are would both be great winners if Thibodeau did not exist. Uh, Thibodeau will win the award deservingly. Like I said, in Minnesota, I felt like he did set us back a couple of years, but I'm not going to discredit at all what he's doing in New York. Props to him. Yeah, so these three coaches, all great. And then a lot of guys I got to talk about is honorable mentions. Doc Rivers, what he did in Philly this year, bring him to the one seed. Uh, I got to mention Mike Malone. You know, Mike Malone keeping Nuggets at three without Jamal Murray. I see that MVP, Nikola Jokic, but still very impressive. I even I, – Vogel, he's not even close to this conversation, but I even got to give Vogel credit. Lakers without LeBron and AD, that is a bottom 10, bottom five team in the league. No disrespect to those players, but that, that's not a good team in the league. And he kept them at like a point five hundred, maybe slightly below right. Shout out to James Borrego. Shout Nate McMillan. Got another guy I can't forget. He didn't coach the whole year, so he can't be on here. But if he if he did, the Hawks are sim- – I mean, they were projected higher than the Knicks, so I'd still give it to Thibodeau. But McMillan really turned them around a halfway season. Who knows? If he coaches a full year, maybe they're the three seed or something. Probably not, but you never know. Okay, now we're going to get into all NBA. So for my first team – I went Curry, Luka, Kawhi, Giannis, Jokic. So Jokic is a no-brainer, MVP. Curry's a no-brainer, guard. So a lot of people are going to be like, okay, you had Chris Paul on your MVP list at four. You did not have Luka. Uh, I just I just see MVP and all NBA a little bit different. You know, both you have to factor winning, but MVP you factor winning a little bit more. All NBA you factor individual success a little bit more. And this season, Luka was obviously better than Chris Paul still as a player. So... 
I put Luke in there. Um, I could have put Embiid at the four because he's eligible there, but it's just I, I wanted to keep it somewhat traditional. Embiid did not play power forward this year, so I'm not going to put him at the four. Giannis was kind of an obvious pick, and then it, it did. You know, I don't want to discredit Kawhi. Kawhi quietly had a very good season. I think 25, 8, and 5 on 50-40, uh, 51% from the field, 40% from three. So he he quietly had a very good season. But I, I think in prior years, like, he would have been like, okay, there's no chance he makes first team. Had there been a better forward? So if I put him beat here, right, that, that would have been an easy way out. But uh, still shout out Kawhi. Had a good season. I'll put him first team. Okay, second team. Chris Paul, obviously. Damian Lillard, obviously. These two guys have um, – Dame individually had a great season. Even was in the MVP convos for a little bit. Kind of fell off because he struggled for a little in the back end of the season. But uh, came through at the end, saved the dude's house, got 42 wins, got the sixth seed. Uh, had a very good season once again. I think he carried over what he did in the bubble last year. Obviously not to that extent. Because it's 72 games compared to eight. But really impressive. Chris Paul talked about him a lot in the MVP, in the Monty Williams. Uh, he's he's had a great season individually, team success-wise. He deserves a second team. Then forwards was when it became tough. So Embiid was a clear pick for center. You could argue he's the second best, uh, second best season this year. He was my second for the MVP. So it, it made it easy to put him second team NBA behind Jokic. Uh, but forwards, I ended up going with Randall. Gets a lot of credit. He played 71 games this year. So one away from playing a full season. He led them to the four seed. Individually just great. 24, 10, and 6. 41% from three. Had to give it to him. And then the last forward spot was tough. I just went with LeBron. He only played 45 games, but in those games, he was MVP caliber. He had them at the one seed. Uh, I, I consider a lot of guys there. Uh, if you did not have LeBron on any three teams, wouldn't make me mad. But I, I just I just went with him because, you, you know, you can't go wrong with going with probably still the best player in the league. So went with LeBron. And then we get to the third team. So here's where it gets really tough, right? Guards. Uh, I needed to have Westbrook on. So I came into this thinking, okay, I haven't had a net on here yet. I haven't had a wizard on here yet. I haven't had a jazz player on here yet. So I want to get one of each. Right. So it came down to Westbrook versus Beal. And I'm thinking Beal, the second leading scorer in the league, dropping 36 for a bit, kept the Wizards alive for a little bit. Westbrook was down at some parts of the year. Average, how crazy is this? 22, 12, and 12. Never will be done again. Except maybe by this guy again, right? Uh, Phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal. So you got Westbrook. And the reason, the way I differentiated them was I felt when the Wizards made their push, they were 17 and 33, right? Then they finished, I think it was 17 and six. He was the engine. He he was the guy leading them. Beal was even injured some of those games. Westbrook ended up playing more than Beal, even though he like played with a torn quad. He had to sit out for rest and stuff. Uh, so I ended up giving that edge to Westbrook. I see him a little bit biased. He's probably one of my favorite players in the NBA, but... Went with him. I wouldn't be mad if you had neither of them, but that was just my opinion. Kyrie. So, to, for me, I just consider three guys here. Kyrie Irving, James Harden, Donovan Mitchell. I took out James Harden because he only played 44 games. And I can't forget about what happened in Houston. Uh, it was – basically when he did that, in my opinion, it it kind of – you know, he was saying, I'm brushing away any chances of uh, awards for the season. Obviously, he was still an all-star, but – uh, that that kind of gave me an easy out to say, okay, no hard. And then I was like, okay, it's easily Kyrie over Mitchell because Mitchell missed a lot of time at the end of the season. And then I go back and look at the stats. Mitchell played 53 games. Kyrie played 54. So it's it's so, so close. And I really do think Mitchell, with leading that uh, best player on the Jazz team that got the first seed, it, it's tough for me to say he doesn't deserve it. Uh, he obviously does. But Kyrie, I have to give it to Annette because they're the two seeds in the East. He went 50, 40, 90. Uh, for, you know, really good season for Kyrie. And props to him for that. So obviously Mitchell was a tough snub. Beal was a tough snub. Ton of guys here who deserve it at the guard position. You know, Zach Levine deserves it. Uh, 
Jalen Brown, Drew Holiday, Devin Booker. The list goes on. So forwards, also difficult. I went with Paul. Paul George was actually a, a pretty easy pick. Uh, I've thought about putting him second team. You, you People, you know, love to hate on him. He struggled in the playoffs. I've been critical of him. But this regular season, he was great. I I could make an argument that he was the best player on that Clippers team. He In, in almost every game I watched, he looked better than Kawhi. Like, so uh, you could make that case, but I still like Kawhi's consistency. You know, Paul George, sometimes on primetime games, he still puts up a stinker. You'll have that Dallas game where Kawhi's not playing and they lose by 50. Uh, but still, Paul George, great season, good efficiency, good defense, uh, good offense, all around good. And then I went with Tatum. This could be Jimmy Butler. The way I separated them, I've talked about it before, but Tatum played 64 games. I did not realize that. I thought he missed a lot more because um, he had COVID. So I thought, oh, he probably missed 10, 15 games. But uh, he – he was he was good and he only missed eight games so I'm gonna I'm give him I'm gonna give him some respect uh and and I think he was like what 26 seven and four average efficiency good defense put Boston in the seven seed so not great but if I'm gonna put a wizard on here probably gotta you know put a Celtic on here uh and then the guy I left off was Jimmy Butler right Jimmy only played 51 games but I'd say when he was playing maybe a little bit better than Tatum 21 seven and seven. 50% from the field. Can't shoot the three, but elite defense. So, so I was I couldn't decide there. I was like, you know what? We'll put Tatum here. We'll throw Butler later in this video. And then finally, I got Rudy Gobert. Uh, no doubt about it. He's, he, in my opinion, clear third best center this year. Uh, although, like, you know, I think Carl Anthony Towns is a better player, right? Bam might also be a better player. But in terms of season, in terms of team success, got to give it to Gobert. Okay, all defensive first team. We're going to run through this a little bit quick. It's not too complicated. I got Ben Simmons, Drew Holiday, two best guard defenders in the league, no doubt in my opinion. Draymond Green, if you didn't think he was a good defender, but you watch that Warriors-Lakers game, you know, and you see now why he's here. Giannis did his thing defensively. And with the Bucks, man, they got a ton of great individual. Like Drew Holiday, top two defensive guard in the league. Giannis, could make the case he's the best defensive player in the league, you know. Uh PJ Tucker's a good defender, Chris Middleton's a good defender. Uh like Brooke Lopez is a good rim protector. So I don't understand why they're they're so bad at all. like they they have a lot of games where they, they just suck on defense, you know, 146 to the Spurs. Uh and they don't they obviously don't suck at defense, but we'll see how uh things turn on the playoffs because right now they're like on paper, they should be a top five defensive team in the league, and I, I don't think they are. You know, don't quote me on that, but uh, I've heard they're one of the worst teams in the league at defending the three. And when you watch it, that's what it looks like. So, still though, these two individually top defenders. So I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, team wise, they're a little bit underwhelming. Okay, second team. This this was tough because actually guards this year, I I couldn't think of many guys. I thought about Fred Van Vliet. Six foot guy, undrafted, famously, you know, bet on yourself. He he is, you know, one of my favorite players in the league. But I, I ended up not going with him just because the Raptors have been kind of just weird this year. We'll get to the Raptors later. Uh so I went with Lou Dort. Inspiration. You know, shout out Manit if he's watching. That that's his guy. Uh Lou Lou Dort is is someone who, you know, came really came from nothing, bro. Undrafted. Shows up in the playoffs, he can be he becomes uh, the hardened stopper. Drops 30 in game seven with really he doesn't have an offensive game. Uh in this season, he put the clamps down defensively as well. He was one of the bright spots in that Thunder team. He could develop, you know. Uh love Lou Dort. So then we got Thibel, total disruptor on defense. You know, he doesn't play as many minutes, so you can make a total case he's not on here, but gave it to him. He's just a disruptor on defense. He's dead just for defense. You go in the playoffs, I, I, you know, you play the Bucks, put them on Chris Middleton. You play, play the, uh, what's it, Nets, put them on Harden or Kyrie or Durant. I mean, why not? Jimmy Butler, great defensive season. Like I said, I didn't put him on all NBA, so got to show him some love, even though he did my Tim Rolls dirty. Uh, still had a great season, though. Um, leader of that Miami defensive squad, and their, their, defense, their defense this year was pretty good. Then I got Mikel Bridges. 
Uh, part of you know, got to show some love to someone on the Suns. He was great defense. He was great defensively last year, and he just followed it up this year by being um, that athletic wing who can help take the other side's uh, best player and limit them. And then I got Bam. He was top three in my defensive player of the year, so he's got to be on here. So once again, I could have moved Bam to the four, so put him at forward, and then put Embiid or Miles Turner here. And that, that probably would have – you probably would have got a more accurate depiction of, like, the best defensive players in the league. But I just I just decided to keep it traditional. Okay, so now we go on to all-rookie. Um, luckily here it's easier because it's positionless. You just pick the five best guys. So I went Edwards, Lamelo, Hal Burton. Don't need to talk about those three. Uh, I went IQ quickly. I think for a portion this year, Twitter and, like, NBA in general was overhyping him a little bit, like – he was ahead of Ant in Rookie of the Year ladders, but that's no disrespect to him. I just went back and looked at it. He, he's kind of – he shoots less than 40% from the field. Uh, but he's still, what, 12, 4, and 4, and he energized that Knicks team, man. He 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 was that, you know, uh, plug for them, and, and props to him for that. He kind of – late in the season, he didn't play as much because you know Phipps. He plays the starters 38 minutes a game, right? Uh, and he started Alfred Payton over him. But still very promising and absolute steal in the draft. Got to give it to IQ. Jay Shante for Rockets, 25-year-old rookie. Uh, I like him too. You know, I think he was undrafted. And he comes in and he, he balled, you know. So gave it to him. Uh, the, like with these guys, I kind of just picked the guys I watched and liked. You know, I didn't I didn't think too much about numbers, which is why. So a couple guys here. So I have Sadiq Bey, uh, good player for the Pistons. Balled out at times this year. I think he had like a game where he like made eight threes or something. Uh, Cole Anthony hit that game winner against my Wolves. Uh, Cole Anthony's very good though. Um, he he, I think, is a guy who is going to have a very good career. Desmond Bain, uh, Peyton Pritchard. So Peyton Pritchard, every time I watch the Celtics, he's making a big play. Uh, he is like a very ideal backup point point guard. If he can develop into like TJ McConnell. He'll have a very good career as well, just like Anthony. There'll be different types of players, but got to show some love to Pritchard. Uh, and then I put Jane McDaniels because just a homer pick right there, purely homer, but he was very good. Uh, solid three-point shooter, great defender. I think probably the best defender in the class right now. Gave life to the Wolves. He's going to be part of that core for the future. So a couple guys I have to leave off here. Isaiah Stewart had a really good season for the Pistons, you know, eight points a game, seven rebounds. But left him off because I put Sadiq Bey here. Uh, who are some other guys? Isaac Okoro. Patrick Williams was a tough guy to leave off. A lot of guys had good seasons. Uh, you know, people calling this a weak rookie class. Well, it's yet to be seen, but some promising guys from this year. Okay, and now we're going to close out with just some some talk. I just added this section because I want to talk about some teams like you know, the Timberwolves. So the biggest disappointment, it's at number three, I got the Wolves. And you could go with a lot of teams here. Uh, I think you could go with, you know, um, let me let me think. The Pacers are one option. I think you could put the Kings. I think you could put the Pelicans. Pelicans are actually a good pick. Uh, man, I think you could put the Lakers or Warriors. But the Timberwolves, despite their injuries, they, they, did, they really did disappoint me this year. I thought this year they could compete uh, for that play-in spot. And I am excited for the future. Cat, Ant, D'Lo, Malik, Josh Kogi, uh, Jane McDaniels, Nas Reed, Jalen Noel, Ricky Rubio, new coach and Finch, Rosas, GM. He's making a lot of good moves. Or actually, I think he's the president. Um, I, I'm excited for the future, but this season was a huge disappointment. Not only do you – Suck the first half of the year, ravaged by injuries, fire your coach. Uh, there's there's like a, t- a ton of drama just surrounding everything. And you get to like the halfway point. You get all-star break. And then you start winning, which is nice. But also you, you don't keep your pick anymore. They're, they're not going to keep their pick in this draft. So uh, I don't think the problem – I'm okay with not keeping the pick because I don't think the problem with this team is talent. I think they need reps. I think they need defense. I think they need to play together. Uh, but I'm not going to sit here and, and say this year wasn't a big disappointment. And then number two, I got the Celtics. Uh, 
I know they had COVID issues. I know they had injuries, but you cannot tell me this team is satisfied with seven. It, it puts everyone on the hot seat. Brad Stevens, he won't be fired this year if they lose to the Nets, but one more year and he's done. Uh, Danny Ainge, same for him, right? Uh, they they just consist. They had such a nice core a couple years ago, and they consistently got, I think, a little bit too greedy, and players in that locker room did not, you know, mesh well together. Now they're the seventh seed. I picked them to get swept by the Nets. We'll see if they take two games off. Maybe the season's not a disappointment anymore. But we we got to see what happens. There there are many pieces away from contending now. I think a couple years ago they they made the conference finals three of the last four years, right? And uh, they they were just super complacent. And it's easy to say that in hindsight. So uh, I I think they expected their guys to grow and. Their team to just like you know like playing with each other and they could win, but never made that big move. Never got pieces back for Kyrie, Horford, Gordon Hayward. So disappointment number two sucks. And then one, I got the Raptors. So Raptors fans do not seem to be too dis. I mean, they're obviously disappointed, but not they don't they don't seem to be too sad because they won a championship a couple years ago. And yeah, that's all right. Uh, but going from the two seed to not making the playoffs with a they still got Siakam. They got Van Vliet. They got Lowry. They got, uh, you know, Boucher. Nor- they had Norm Powell. They traded him for Gary Trent, right? I- I'm just surprised how bad they finished. I mean, they finished in 12th in the East. I- who would have saw that coming? So I got to have him number one. And we'll just close off on a more positive note because I don't want to just, you know, crap on teams here. So, yeah, we got we got Knicks and Hawks, right? Put them in one picture because they're playing each other. Uh, Knicks, we've talked about them a ton, but also the Hawks, man, with what Nick McMillan did. I think going into the season, if you said they would have been fifth, some people would have believed it. Ahead of the Celtics and um, Heat, maybe not, but like you could see them being fifth. But the way they started, they go to like 10th, they fired their coach, and then they get Nick McMillan, who a lot of guys do not really respect. The way they fought back and got to fifth and now have a winnable playoff series against the New York Knicks. Got to give them props. Uh, they were one of the biggest surprises here. And then I got Utah, like I said earlier, going to 6-1 to one without making any big additions in free agency or to draft. Uh, no coaching change. No personnel change. Very impressive. We'll see how they pan in the playoffs because if they somehow lose in the first round, uh, even losing in the second round now, and it's it's going to become a bunch of memes. You know, the, the, the 2015 Hawks thing is going to be spams again but okay yeah so covered a lot in this video uh really if you watch until now thank you man thank you uh, i appreciate it uh just gonna be more things coming bigger and better content uh but yeah until next time peace out